Welcome back to A Lifetime of Mafia Tales. Today we continue our new series named Mafia Row. Sal went to Lewisburg Prison in 1974. He met all kinds of different mobsters from all different kinds of crime families. In today's video we discuss Sal going to prison and meeting members of the Philadelphia Mafia. The Philadelphia mobsters Sal met were Phil Chicken Man Testa, Salvatore Testa, and Harry the Hunchback Riccobini. All three of these men would go on to be high-ranking mobsters in the Philadelphia crime family. Please subscribe to our Patreon channel for more exclusive stories about these guys. Also, please be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more future interviews from us. And without further ado, let's get into today's story. Good morning, Sal. We got another good episode today. We're going to be talking about the Philly guys, man. This should be an oh, interesting yeah. one. Interesting guys, the both of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, back in 1974, you were in Lewisburg prison, and, you know, you were a part of the whole Mafia Row uh, uh, section of the prison, and you met all kinds of different guys. And we, like I said, you know, the last few weeks, we've just been covering so many. You know, we covered yeah. the Purple Gang guys. We covered Johnny Dio, Joe Armone, and Pauly Vario, and there's still so much more to cover, so... You know, today's episode, we're going to particularly focus on the Philly guys that you met in there. And one was Phil Testa. He became the boss of the family. And then he met his son, Sal Salvatore Testa, when he came to visit his father one time. And then Harry Riccobini, who was involved in that bloody war out in Philly. So these guys went on to do a lot of stuff on the street. But when you met them back in 1974, from what you tell me, it sounds like there was a lot different. So you know, take us back to 1974, and then we'll go into, you well, know, their um, later years. I met them uh, when I went to the uh, the hospital in Lewisburg, the uh, prison hospital. I had to go, uh, you know, see a doctor about, you know, my psychiatric condition, you know. So uh, I was in there for like a day or two or three, and then... You know, I saw those two guys there, and then I saw them playing outside, you know, outside the, conf the confines of the hospital. They were playing chess, and I'd sit out there and watch them play. You know, they didn't mind, but, you know, there was no conversation because they were deep, deep in their chess game. Um, I don't know who won, but they, they would play one game the way I understood it, one game for three, four, five days. That long. Yeah, they wow. were both good chess players. And uh, Phil Tessa, he had a funny complexion. He had like, uh, you know, pitted face. And they called him Chicken Chicken Phil. And Harry Riccobini was an old man by then. He was in his 70s. And he was a little bit of a guy the size of Danny DeVito. <laughs> I mean, I'm telling you, he was like four foot 11 maybe, you know? Yeah. He walked hunched over because he had like a hunchback. And oh, that's uh, where he got his nickname, yeah. Yeah, they didn't talk much about anything too too uh too public, you know. I mean, they just didn't talk. They were chess players. Occasionally, you know, one would get up and maybe go to the bathroom or he got called in for a doctor's visit or something. It was like a waiting room outside the, the prison ho hospital. And I'd talk about chess with him. That was it. That was the only way to identify with them, you know. Um they, I didn't see them in the in the uh, prison cafeteria. I didn't see them, but you know the other guys, uh, you know the guys up in the room, Dio, Pauli Vario, Armon. They knew, they knew those guys. How they knew them, I don't know. I mean, I really, I, I don't know what their affiliation was, mm -hmm. but they were very closed mouth. They were quiet, um, and I didn't ask any questions. I just watched the chess game. I was interested in learning. Well, well, I mean, you talked about going and, you know, do, having you, you know, you went to the prison doctor and they checked your your mental state. I mean, do you think these guys had any mental state or do you think that, well, I mean, what was that all about? No, they had physical issues. Oh, that's all it was. It wasn't yeah. like the years, yeah. the Ubots, you, you no, playing no, the crazy they card. No, they weren't playing. They weren't, you know, trying to convince the doctor that they were loony no not at all you know <laughs> but they uh they were pretty close mouthed about them you know and i had talked to a couple of philly guys who weren't made guys that i met in there and they knew all about them they knew they had quite a reputation back in philadelphia 
So they were giving you a little bit of background on what who they were. I mean, did they yeah, talk about yeah, any particular I mean, crimes Chick or anything? Phil talk, Chick and Phil talked about his son. Chick and Phil talked about his son Salvi. His name was Sal, and then um, Ma- um, Harry Riccobini had a brother named Mario. So yeah. he talked about him once in a while. They had long-standing uh, families involved, as far as I knew. But I never talked about them to crime, not at all, you know. Well, what about when... get to know their personalities. Yeah. What about when you met his Phil son, Sal Testa? I mean, what was that like? Uh, how did you come across him? I was in a visiting room, and um, I think I was out there. My wife would get there early when the, when the door opened. And then Phil Testa came in, and I saw this young, young, uh, good-looking kid come over and hug him and and he sat right across from me and uh, and then phil introduced me he said uh sal to me this is my son salvi and i shook hands with him he was like 18 years old but he was pretty muscular looking guy had you know had interesting features he didn't look at all like his father no i don't think so Plus he went on people could read about him he went on to be quite a hitman you know but that was like years later, because when I met him, I think he was just like 18 years old. Just young, really young. I yeah. mean, he would he would go on to die young, too. But yeah, I, I mean, I can, you know, go into expanding a little bit more on. I mean, if you, I want you to expand on him as much as you can. I mean, from is there any more that you can add into? There wasn't a lot that I ever talked about with those guys. I mean, I didn't even know, you know, what their status was until after I got out. I paid attention to the news stories. And, uh, you know, a couple of years later, they were in the news. I mean, it was a Philadelphia war going on. Yeah. Yeah. So, and it was a bloody, a bloody situation. That was like, say, 1980 when, uh, when uh, the boss, Bruno, mm-hmm. he, Angelo Bruno was killed. Of course, years later, you know, what did I know? Years later, I guess it was in 2012 or something, 10 or 12. I went to Philadelphia uh, on that documentary that National Geographic did. So it was like years and years later. I had no interest in Philadelphia. But by that time, there was a lot of news about all the mob killings in Philly. Yeah, well, you'd mentioned Angelo Bruno. And, you know, after Angelo Bruno had died, Phil Testa became the boss after him. You know, I mean, I, I can go into, you know, Phil's background and stuff from what I researched. I mean, he was born in Philadelphia. Uh, you, you know, he befriended uh, Angelo Bruno. Somehow they formed a relationship. And then, uh, you know, Phil Testa, he was um, also, was, they didn't know what he was making money off of back then, the police. So that what they labeled him in his report was that he was just a common gambler and was able to live off his earnings. But who knows? He could have been involved with rackets and stuff back then. I'm not sure. But, you know, he also, like you said, he had his son, Salvatore Testa, involved with the family as well. His, you know, his son became a made man in that and then a capo later. But um, in 1970, Phil Testa became the underboss. So I guess he would have been the underboss then when you would have met him. Yeah, I, di- I didn't know that. <laughs> and and, I, and the way it looks was uh, Bruno was killed in 1980. So he spent 10 years. I don't know lo- how long he was in prison, but I, I don't even know when he got out. Because once I left Lewisburg, I didn't pay attention to the rumors, the stories about Philadelphia. Uh, it was always looked at like Philly was like a little satellite, you know, bunch of guys. In, in a crew or two or something in it that was that it was insignificant. But later on, we realized how bloody that whole city got. They were all fighting for a piece of the pie. And of course, um, you know, when they blew up chicken Phil Tester on the front steps of his house, I mean, it was it got to be so popular. Bruce Springsteen, you know, did a song about about Testa or mentioned him in one of his songs. Yeah, I think it was called Atlantic City, the song, yeah. Yeah, the uh, yeah. album, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, like I said, so he was the underboss for a number of years, and then after uh, Angelo Bruno had died, you know, Phil Testa became the boss, and then he wasn't the boss for much long, for very long. You know, like you said, uh, Angelo Bruno died in 1980. 
And then by the time, you know, Phil Testa, you know, he was the boss for like a year. So and then in 1981, he came home. And then as he was opening his door at his home, a nail bomb exploded from right. underneath his porch. And his death was uh, allegedly ordered by his underboss and drug trafficker, Peter Cas Casella, and a capo, Frank Narducci Sr., which, uh, you know, later it says that Frank Narducci was gunned down. And then uh, uh, the other guy, Peter, he was banished and went to, you know, Florida. So I, that's kind of all alleged. But that's just something I read in the reports that I was going through. And then, yeah, uh, you know, Phil's Testa's murder, it sparked up a war in that whole Philly, that Philly crime family, you know, because there's probably different factions and stuff that supported him and stuff. But that's when Nikki Scarfo, he took that uh, position to become the boss. And then again, in the report, it says Chucky Merlino was his underboss and you know, Frank Monty became the consigliere. So yeah, that's kind of how the power shifted up is from what I read. Well, I, you know, did research a little bit about Harry Riccobini and he had his own crew and I guess he didn't want to pay whoever, I guess he got into a conflict with Scarfo too, I think. And they mm -hmm. tried to kill him several times. There was all kinds of stories about how many times he got shot. And by that time, he was in his 80s. He yeah. was a tough old man. I know. So, you know, Harry, he was born in Sicily. From what I, um, and then Harry was uh, became a soldier under the Prohibition mob boss, Salvatore Sabella, in 1927. So, I mean, this guy goes back, you know, yeah. and you know, after uh, running the family for one year, Phil Testa, you know, he was killed. And then Nicky Scarfo became the boss. And Harry Riccobini, this is where it ties in what you're saying. You know, he led a faction against Nicky Scarfo right. for control of the, you know, the family's operations in that Atlantic City that, you know, blew up that they thought wasn't going to blow up with all that gambling yeah. operations. So that that's what started that whole war. And, uh you know, this was an order that was given as well from Nicky Scarfo's consigliere, Frank Monty. You know, he informed the crew that he was going to have Harry Riccobini killed. And, you know, he's going to take over his loan sharking operations and all of his illegal gambling operations. And then, uh, you know, Frank, this is how they tried to set up Harry. They said, you know what? They went to his brother, Mario. I remember you were talking about Mario. Right. And he said... Uh, and then that was his half brother, I believe. That was, you know, what I read. And they said that he demanded that Mario set up his brother Harry Riccobini to be killed, but that's not what happened. You know, what I mean, no. they uh, Mario betrayed, you know, Frank Monty by telling Harry Riccobini about the plot, and so Harry ordered that, you know, so Harry eventually ordered a hit on Joseph and uh, Vic. They were both on the other opposite faction, and you know. They ended up getting them, I believe. I don't know if they killed them, but I think they shot them. And that's what started this whole Philly war from 1982 to 1984 is how long it lasted. Wow. Yeah. And then the kid, he became quite a hitman, Salvi Testa, the son. Yeah, he did. And he was so for his background, you know, he was born in 1956. <laughs> of course, he was the son to Philip. Chicken film, Chicken Man Testa. Yeah, and, you know his father was the underboss for a while, and then became the boss. And then, you know, Salvatore Testa became a made man in that family. I believe in 1980. You know, just a little after his father was blown up, and then, you know, he inherited all a lot of his father's loan sh sharking operations, and he became a top earner in that family. And then. Uh, you know, in 1982, there was an attempt on his life and, you know, he almost died, but he ended up living. And then the the reason for them shooting at him was because they wanted revenge for that. Like I said, they were from the other opposite faction. The Harry Riccobini one was that Vic and Joseph, they were shot. I don't know if they were killed. Um, so they went and retaliated and they shot that uh, Salvatore Testa. So, you know, that that's where that happened. But, you know, in 1984, he ultimately did get killed. So, I mean, it was only a few years after his dad. And then the orders were given by Nicky Scarfo, apparently. And, you know, Salvatore was growing up 
the ladder, you know what I mean, on the mafia. And yeah. Gaining a lot of respect, a lot of money. So they said that Nikki Scarfo was just kind of, uh, what would you say, jealous? or He's probably worried. jealous. And I think he had, I think uh, Scarfo had him set up by his best friend to kill him, from what I read. Well, the name of the guy was Salvatore Grande. So yeah. I don't know if that was one of his close friends, but that's who he was shot by. And yeah, it was hard to get close to uh, Salvi Testa from what I read. Mm -hmm. And so I think he showed up at, at a friend's house and they killed him and dumped him, dumped his body somewhere. Uh, he also had some conflict about someone he was going to marry. He didn't want to marry the girl or something. And there was a lot of rumor about that. Yeah. So, you know, all this kind of information comes out eventually, you know. And the government, you know, they know about things. Uh, you know, the FBI, for example, people don't know this. They went to John Gotti and told Gotti that he was scheduled to be killed. <laughs> Did you ever hear that? Yeah, because they're supposed to tell him if there's an attempt on their life. Yeah. They usually so, don't take it seriously. Right. So whatever happened in Philadelphia, I don't know, but they must have had a lot of active FBI agents working there because... With the uh, oncoming explosion of money in Atlantic City that was, you know, the Atlantic City blew up in a couple of years. There was so much going on there. You know, there was unions there. There was all kinds of ways to make money around the gambling operations. And the mob was deeply entrenched in there. Oh, they got, they got uh, politicians involved, you know, where there was payoffs and all. And Scoffo was fighting for all of that. So, you know, and in 1980, from what I read, you know, Bruno was still in control of the whole Philadelphia mob and the whole casino business exploded right around, you know, the late 70s, 77, 8, 9, like that. So there was a lot of money to be made in Atlantic City. Um, I don't think that Testa was so well known in and around, you know, you know the world of politics and the world of corruption. So it, it seems Scarfo was better at at doing that, getting all the getting all the politicians, you know, on the payroll, you know, scaring them, shaking them down. There was all kinds of stories there. I mean, the government had to deal with a lot in Philadelphia, and the oh, amount yeah. of murders that was taking place way surpassed anything in New York. Yeah, I mean, they were just uh, really going through it with that war, like I said, and that whole you know Scarfo versus Riccobini war that lasted from, you know, 1982 to 1984. And, you know, Nicky Scarfo, he was in prison during that time because he was in a Texas, you know, prison for gun possession. Right. So I mean, he was just giving all these orders. And, you know, during that time, you know, Harry Riccobini began, you know, he formed his own faction and, uh, you know, he was just opposing Nicky and he didn't like that. And so on that, uh, on Riccobini's side, you know, I, I believe he had his brother for sure. You know, his brother ended up flipping and becoming an informant. So, uh, you know, he that's how a lot of this information got out. So, you know, this is how this whole war, you know, the, the I'm sure the feds got a lot of this information. Right. And, you know, that's how Harry Riccobini, he was indicted eventually for, you know, murder charges. And, you know, he was sentenced to life in prison. And ended up dying in 2000. I think he did a. Uh, I think he did an interview. He did he, somehow. He, I think he actually started to talk openly about his life and all. I'm not for sure if he cooperated. Yeah, I'm not sure either. But I think he he went on camera and he talked did. about his whole life. I think he was by that time like 90 years old or something. He probably just didn't. Maybe if he didn't cooperate. It, you know, and then he might have just not cared. I mean, he was just at that point in his life yeah. that, you know, he was just ready to get his story out there or something. Yeah. You know? There was a great scene I that I read about it, him in a telephone booth. They shot him like several times. And uh, he got out of the phone booth and, and attacked this guy who shot him. And the guy, he scared the guy away. And the guy ran away. Rick Abini had been shot, I don't know how many times. And wow. he just, you know, managed to live. You know, he was a tough old man, you know. Yeah, and he was getting involved with all this, you know. I mean, he, he was really, really an old timer, man, because he went yeah. back to the 1920s. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> wow. wow. Decades and decades in that life. Yeah. And, 
you know, but after, you know, Nikki Scarfo had, you know, took out Salvatore Testa, that just really, you know, for the other criminal organizations that they were working with, I mean, they just kind of wanted to back away from him, just seeing how he treated his own men. You know, he was just, you know, really dishonest and just. He was, yeah, he was known on the street as a treacherous guy. He'd have people killed just out of ego or jealousy. And that's, you know, what happened with him. I mean, it was no different than Angelo Ruggiero. He was jealous of John Gotti, and uh, he had Gotti, you know, kill a couple of people because, you know, Angelo created some kind of story that he fabricated the story about a guy, D.B., where, in fact, you know, Angelo owed the guy, D.B., a couple hundred thousand, so he figured the best way to do away with that guy is get him killed. So he told Gotti a, a story, he fabricated the story that D.B. was you know, talking to, behind his back, and planning to take over the family, which, you know, even Sammy Gravano said that wasn't the story. But, you know, Angelo convinced John to kill him. I know. I've seen that recently in that whole new Netflix mob boss yeah. or how to become yeah. a mob boss. You know, that yeah. they played right. that whole thing out. They animated it. So like oh, a cartoon. I, I didn't see that. Did they play it? <laughs> yeah. It's, you know, it's a cool show. I mean, it's like, the, I mean, it's like Get Gotti and now the, you know, this one came out, so it sounds like they're really into the whole mob stuff. So, you yeah. know, but I mean, take us back again to the prison. So now we know what they've <laughs> done on the street. So, I mean, you, like you said, they weren't really talkative. They were quiet guys. But apparently at that time, yeah. uh, you know, Phil well, they, Tester was the underboss. They showed up up in the room, you know, Mafia Row. They showed up. They were friends with uh, with. Johnny Dio and Paul Vario. So they knew each other. They knew each other. They just didn't openly stand up and say, hey, I'm a made guy in Philadelphia. You know, it was like rumors. Sort of the rumors traveled between the guys like us young guys that weren't made guys. We were in prison with all these guys. And 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 somehow a lot of the guys from Philadelphia, there were young guys there coming up and they were ready to go out. You know, in those days, in prison, you only did a third of your time. So if you got five years, you knew you were doing 20 months and they're going to release you. There was no parole board, no parole hearings in, in the 1970s. They had the old sentencing system where you did one third. So if you got 10 years, you did 40 months and that was it. You did your 40 months and out you went. And a lot of guys took pleas for a five-year prison term and they did 20 months and they got out. Damn. That, that's how the system worked in the 70s. Of course, after that, with the proliferation of the drugs, they changed the sentencing laws. And then once you got 10 years, you didn't get out in 40 months. No. They, wanted, they wanted you to do like, you know, 75% of your time. So yeah, they you know, really it was changed. a real revolving door in Lewisburg back in the 70s. Guys would come in, they got five years, they'd be out. Ten years, they'd be out. Not not a lot of guys got long-term prison sentences like GG, who got 56 years, or I think Johnny Echoes got 40 years. The Harlem guys, they got the most time of anybody in, in Lewisburg. I remember that. All those Harlem guys got 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. And that was the beginning of the change. And that was the beginning of guys who were drug dealers saying, oh, boy, I don't want to get convicted of drugs and I'm going to go through 30, 40 years. So Right around, right after the time I got out in 75, by the time 80 came, a lot of these guys entertained the ideas of flipping, mm. you know, because they were getting, they were getting long sentences. Yeah. I mean, the drugs, once that came into factor, I mean, yeah. people were getting hundreds of years, man. I mean, yeah. I don't know what Philadelphia's drug culture was. You could, re I, you know, you could read about it. I wasn't interested in all that information. I was only interested in making money. You know, people think if you're in and around the mob, every mob guy wants to become a maid guy. They want to have some kind of prestige. They want to have, you know, sort of like a reputation. After I got out of prison and Foxy was dead, I was only interested in making money. Yeah. I wasn't going to rub elbows with all these mob guys trying to move up the ladder because I knew, in fact, they all became treacherous and you were going to get killed. And just the whole Gotti crew turned bad, and I wasn't with the Gambinos anyway. I was officially with the Colombo guys. Well, you know, I can tell you from what I've interviewed a guy 
who was a capo in that family, the Philly family. His name's Bobby Luisi, and he gave some insight about his crew and the, he, you know, being a made guy and talking about what his operations were. I mean, his was mainly being involved with drugs, selling drugs, and that was his thing. You know what I mean? So that was by the you know eighties and nineties. You know, yeah, you know, so yeah, I'm sure it all changed in the eighties. Yeah, because really? that would have been when you would have been out of there. Yeah, you know, yeah. late late eighties and shit. So yeah, I mean, it was so regional. I mean, you you got involved with a couple of guys from from the auto the auto business. I went to things were changing rapidly after I got out of Lewisburg in in seventy five. And what most people don't know is that I was really interested in backing away from all the mob activities. I was only interested in dealing with Cataldo getting the heroin and selling selling drugs and making money. I remember someone said Sal didn't even know Sammy Gravano. Well, in 1980, I don't think anybody knew who Gravano was around the Gambino guys because he was really, I think, assigned to the Columbos from what, what he said. And I had moved upstate New York in 81, 82 and got out of New York City. So I didn't associate with anybody. Yeah, you're ready to get out of there at that point. Yeah, because everybody was killing each other. Yeah. You know, the thing about Tommy, Tommy getting killed after the, the Lufthansa heist and all, everybody was turning, you know, to violence, knocking off each other. And I could see all that coming. And then there was so many guys flipping. Uh, when I left New York City, I wasn't interested in interacting with any other mob guys. That was it. I was sort of done. Yeah. Had I not, you know, ran out of money while I was building that racetrack, I might have never went back to New York City. <laughs> That's true, man. I mean, everything kind of played out for a reason. You got out yeah. of there and, you know, and things just went, you know, different. You got out of there and moved, went to the program and everything, man. So Yeah, yeah. You know. But Philadelphia was, was a hot spot for mob activities. And it was, you know, I don't know how many – different crews were there. They were just killing each other. It was really pretty bizarre when I was reading about it, you know, and then I wasn't interested. I just, what you know, I'd read about it and that would be it. And I was surprised those two guys that I met, Chick and Phil Tester and Harry Riccobini, how they became, you know, rivals, arch enemies, you know, fighting over whatever they were fighting over. I mean, Riccobini was an old timer, man. So he probably had shallow customers for years and years, you know, they, then you sort of inherit more Shylock customers when you make loans. You know, people don't realize the power of, of three or four or five percent a week on money. If yeah. You add up, that was a lot of money back back in the eighties. Yeah, and I would imagine, you know, at that time, you know, Phil Testa, he was the underboss. And then, you know, Harry Riccobini, he must have been like a capo in that family. And I could see why. I mean, they got along. They were with each other. They were with the same family. But then after, I mean, you're right. They they were on different opposing factions, and the whole right. war started. And you know, yeah. it's you know, they become enemies just over, you know, money is really well, what I, it always comes down to: money and power. I think Scoffo tried to shake down Riccobini. Really? You know, Riccobini was so much older than Scoffo. He was around forever. So uh, he, I guess, he didn't want to pay Riccobini. He didn't want to I, yeah. give up a piece of his uh, his his pie. I remember. I, I think I might have actually seen that in a documentary too. Was that that's what really pissed him off? Because you know the old bosses and stuff. He was already aligned with you know Harry Riccobini. They didn't make him kick up or a certain amount. But you know, uh, Nicky Scarfo. He was the new boss, so he was like anybody that you know, everybody's got to pay up, you know, if not, right. then we're going right. to have some problems. Right. And that's, that's what he did. He sent his guys and that's what they started the whole day of war, man. Yeah. It went <laughs> but, on for years and years, that whole thing. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think what really people can take away from, you know, Phil Testa and, you know, Salvatore Testa, Harry Riccobini is like, you know, I mean, you follow your family into this life. I mean, look how it ended for, Phil Testa, Salvatore Testa. I mean, they right. both were murdered. I right. Mean, he, he followed his father into that life. Imagine his father was, uh, you know, something else. I mean, you know, you never know what could happen. You know, it's just like, I mean, what you know, what you see is what you know, and that's what you kind of get involved with. So, right. I mean, what do you, what do you think about that? Oh, I just think um, 
you know, the old timers, it was so secretive in the 60s, 70s, that they made it appear to be romantic. They made it appear to be honorable to be involved with wise guys, okay? Yet, at the same time, they started to, you know, become treacherous killers, killing, you know, the killing uh, that took place in Philadelphia, it wasn't created by guys, you know, violating the boss's orders or sleeping with a, a boss's wife or daughter or becoming an informant. It was all about greed and jealousy. And that's what I think ultimately took down mob guys in New York, Philadelphia, Cleveland. I've spent uh, many of vacations the last 10 years going to Cleveland and talking to people that lived there and saw what went on there. And that was considered the bomb capital of, of the country for the mob. They were blowing each other up. And there was long-term informants that gave the government information in Cleveland. Now, Philadelphia, I don't know. There must have been somebody that gave information because it became very in vogue to work both sides, like Willie Boyd Johnson, like um, the Grim Reaper, Scarpa. I mean, these guys, and even Joe Messina, so a lot of these guys were giving information to the FBI, and the FBI was building cases. Now, what happened in Philadelphia? Who knows how many informants they had on the street? But remember, that was the smaller, smaller city as far, far as organized crime went. And I think, you know, they really had a struggle with the authorities to take down all the corrupt. They took down a lot of corrupt po uh, political figures in Philadelphia. Guys that were mayors, guys that were congressmen. If you if the if the public reads about what happened in Atlantic City to do with the casinos, they had elected officials taking bribes, and the mob was right in the middle of it. I think this guy Leonetti actually sold the property for for Trump to build this casino. He sold it to Trump. You know, wow. people don't pay attention to all of that, but yeah. that's how deeply involved the politics was, and that was like in the late 70s. I think Trump buy, bought the property to build his his Trump casino Trump. there. Yeah. If you do a little research, you'll find that. Yeah, and I mean, you were talking about informants, and they got, you know, Harry Riccobini's brother, Mario, to become an informant, so I'm sure he was, be, like I said, able to provide all this information to the feds and stuff. Right. I mean, like, you know, they were brothers, you know, and they both got involved with this life and spent many, many years into it. I mean, I'm you know, imagine if they went and did something legit and tried to do something more productive. I mean, yeah. they could have lasted years and years because this Harry, I mean, he was this old timer, man. He was there yeah. for so long and involved in the wars, getting shot at and stuff. Yeah. I mean, when you get a chance, put a picture up of, of, of him uh, on our uh, on our site. You can see he had this, you know, big gray beard. He looked like Santa. They actually said he looked like Santa Claus for a while. So. <laughs> yeah. So I think one of his, uh, jurors of one of his cases they they had said that and i was in one of the reports that i read they said he looked like a santa claus or something but yeah, yeah. you know if it ever gets to be a movie man you can have uh, uh who would you would you say he looks like danny devito oh yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> he can play him <laughs> yeah that'd be cool man I, I could totally see that that'd be hilarious but yeah you know, I just say, you know, um, I mean, do you have anything else you want to add into this before we no, go to it's Patreon? Just, you know, in the beginning, when I thought about Philadelphia, I would laugh. And, you know, we thought they were like amateur criminals over there. We didn't see in the 70s how violent and treacherous that all got. But because I guess that Angelo Bruno really ruled Philadelphia. He had control of everything there until 80, till they whacked him out. I don't know who whacked him out. I didn't do the research on that. But, you know, this week I'm going to New York to talk about the Philadelphia crime operations and uh, and Bruno, what happened to him. And I think uh, the people from the U.K. are going to try to connect some U.K. criminals to Angelo Bruno. It'll be interesting how, how they do that, you know, in, in the new documentary they're doing. Oh, yeah. I mean, it'd be really interesting to see how, how that gets portrayed and all that, because yeah. who knows what, how they're going to connect all that to him. And, 
I mean, even with your information, you'll be able to tell them about you being in prison with uh, all all of these these two guys here, and then meeting Salvatore Testa. I mean, these were yeah. major figures in that, so I'm sure they'd be interested yeah. to hear about that. But uh, you know, anybody wants to subscribe to our Patreon, subscribe over there, and we're gonna continue some more stories to this episode. Thank you all for watching, and we'll see you on the next one. That wraps up today's story about Sal going to Lewisburg Prison in 1974 and meeting some Philadelphia mobsters. Two of the three of these men, Phil Chicken Testa and Salvatore Testa, both were murdered. Harry Riccobini ended up living a long life, but spent a lot of time behind bars. It's a terrible life to get into. But furthermore, the Mafia Row prison scene had so many different kind of mobsters. We will continue to cover the rest of these characters week after week. We are working on getting these stories made into a movie. Please comment any key takeaways that you got from this interview please share it with anyone that you think will enjoy this type of content also please be sure to subscribe to our patreon channel to get more exclusive stories about these guys and if you want to continue to get more videos from me and sal on our youtube channel please hit subscribe we got a lot more cool videos coming and we got a lot that we did in the past so please check out the channel if you would like to support our podcast we got a few items that you can purchase all of these items can be found in the video description below the first one is sal's book the sinatra club you can get this personally autographed by Sal. The next one in our hottest seller is the 1972 Sinatra Club playing cards. Back in Sal's Mafia days, he opened up his own social club named the Sinatra Club. Many mobsters would come to this club, even when there were all-out wars going on between different families. They would come to the Sinatra Club and play cards. Some of the mobsters that played with these cards were John Gotti, Dominic Cataldo, Tommy Simone, Foxy, Jimmy Burke, Willie Boyd Johnson, Tony Roach, Henry Hill, Joe Defeaty, Danny Fatico, Gene Gotti, Peter Gotti, Joey Scopo, and many more. We're selling each one of these cards for $10 a piece. These cards are limited, we only got a thousand of them. The next item is an autographed picture of Sal from his Mafia days. Another item is the Dinner with the Mobster card. You can get this autographed as well. This was an event that Sal had hosted in the past. We also got the Ubots production ticket from an event that Sal had hosted. This is also autographed. The last item we got to offer is Sal's book, The Sins of the Father. Again, you can find all these items in the video description below. The last thing that I'll bring up is I got my own podcast that I do. It's on the same YouTube channel. My podcast is called the Invest in Yourself Podcast. But mostly I cover great redemption stories from ex-mobsters, ex-gangsters, drug dealers, drug smugglers, and any other type of criminals you can think of. Thank you again so much for watching, and of course, we'll see you on the next one.